Cool. All right. So we're, we're going to look at hey, John. No, he's gone. Um, so we'll start with uh, talking about quiz problems, or at least the last one. They're fairly straightforward other than that, um, that three-step process, right? Where you had the water being warmed up from um, a 50 gram sample of ice at minus 12 liquid water. Uh, formatting gets me every time on these. Uh, yeah, it should fit. Anyway, I'll shrink it down a little bit. There we go. Um, the only real trick with this is that we had a phase change happen in the middle, right? Other than that, it was just like our, I think I touched that. Um, it was just like our, our regular temperature change problems, right? Um, the, if we wanted to draw the heating curve, which again, is not a bad way to organize your thoughts and make sure you don't forget a step. Our heating curve, we always plot temperature on the, on the y-axis and Q on the, uh, on the x-axis. And as we add energy, we're gonna start at negative 50. No, sorry, negative 12, sorry. We're gonna go up to zero where we hit a phase change, right? And once it hits the phase change, constant temperature, because we're going through a different process at that point, right? The calculations just is even easier if you know your, your enthalpy of fusion. And then once it's all the way melted, going up to body temperature, right? And be a little bit less steep and it's 38 degrees Celsius. So three steps, we've got Q1, Q2, Q3, the ones with the temperature change where you have a slope where it's not horizontal, those are just gonna use our Q equals MCP delta T equation, right? And this one in the middle is even easier calculation. There's only two numbers we really need, right? We know delta H effusion is given 334 joules per gram. And we know how many grams of ice we have. I haven't had a chance to, to grade these yet, so I don't know how everybody did on this one, but this, to my thinking, was the most complicated problem that was on the quiz, right? Um, so I, I think if you had a handle on this one, that you probably were okay with the rest of them as well. Does anybody want to go through it either or any of the other problems? Yeah. Is that the one where I put pounds and grams? Yeah. Yeah. That's a typo, and I'll go through. If you assumed grams and you did the problem properly, I'll go back through and give full credit for that. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw my announcement this morning either, but I also forgot to warn you. Uh, Canvas's auto grader is just hot garbage. Um, yeah. It doesn't do any sort of partial credit, and it's very limited as to what it'll accept as the right answer. So I always go back through, and I'll grade that last problem as well, but I also give partial credit for, for the rest, for anything like, if you got the right answer, but you just entered it wrong, that's full credit. If you um, just made a sig fig error, that's a minor deduction rather than zero points for the whole question. All right, so I'll go back through and look at those. Um, Is my question on that one, did it ask for energy of joules or the answer of joules? Okay, the then I'll fix that too. And then I think the sig fig is So the way that Canvas works with this, with this sig fig, it, Canvas doesn't, do sig figs like at all. I tried yeah. I, I try to make it do sig figs and take it under to account properly. It, it usually doesn't work. So probably what I'll do going forward is instead of having it be a number answer that limits it, you'll just type it in like it's just a text box. Okay. Um, that way you can include your units, make the sig figs look exactly the way you want because otherwise when you type it in, if it's 0 0.0, Canvas simplifies it for you and just yeah. doesn't even write the 0.0. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'm aware of those issues. I'll make sure that that's not going to be an issue for that one. 
Right. It de it depends on what your temperature change, how many CFPs you got out of the temperature change, because that your temperature change is an addition subtraction problem, which switches your rules as well. So I'll look at it again because I'm doing this off the top of my head, but I'll I'll double check the sig figs on that one. Yeah. Jesse? Philip. Uh for question one. I was like you just took like three sig figs for the gallons and miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. And then would we just ignore the six so we have one good question. So on the first problem, a sig fig question. Um on two tanks of gas, how much um, how far can my car go? There's three sig figs on the mileage and there's three sig figs on on the, the capacity of the, the gas. In that case, two is a counting number. We're gonna assume it's two full tanks of gas, not two tanks of gas plus or minus. Um, so we'd call the two in that case would be an exact number. Um, was my thinking when I wrote that. And now is that actually probably accurate? Probably not, right? Because that, you never actually get an entire tank of gas used. So I probably should have said 2.00 to give you the three sig figs, but I was thinking of two as a counting number in that case. And so the two would have been exact. Um, but again, if you if you kept it to one sig fig because of that, I'll make sure that's not an issue. Uh, Nusa? Do you get credit for like work to like if you submitted, mm -hmm. like, like for this question, if you submitted the whole page, you could see that like I did like half of the problems and yeah. then you left, okay. So, and that's that's typically what we'll do going forward to avoid the whole auto grader issue is um, I'll have it set so that it'll show you a right answer, but it'll also give you a chance to upload a file to go with it so that I can see your work. It'll give you the right answer when you turn it in so that you know if you got it right or not, um, but it won't grade anything for you. And that way I can just go back through and give um, give partial credit or full credit as as appropriate. Does that make sense? Basically, the, the net point of this is don't worry when you first hit submit and it says four out of ten. Don't panic because you're gonna I'm, you're gonna get the two points for just asking a question, and I'm gonna go back and give you partial credit for the other ones. Um, unless you just didn't do anything, you're gonna get partial credit on on those other problems too. So uh, it's not as bad as it looks when you first hit submit. And I just forgot to warn everybody. Min. Any other uh, questions on the quiz? Do we want to work through the rest of this? Does everybody see where we're going? We want to work through it? Okay. Q1 and Q3, let's do those because since they're so similar. Q1, the temperature change when it's ice. Mass doesn't change though, so it's 50 grams, right? And it's 2.11. 2.22 is what I wrote. I think it's actually 2.119. I um, wrote it down wrong from memory when I was writing this quickly. And then what's our delta T? Well, because we're only, it's only ice until it hits zero Celsius, mm -hmm. right? So we get our temperature change is just getting to zero Celsius. And then we have the phase change. And then we're going to have a different heat, uh, specific heat. And it tells us 12.0 degrees Celsius. So our delta T is 12.0 degrees Celsius. because you went from negative 12 to zero. So final minus initial is zero minus negative 12, right? Which makes sense. You have to put energy into it to get it to warm up. If you're ever unsure about the sign on your on these energy problems, always go back to, well, does that make sense with, am I adding energy or am I taking energy away? Q3, still our 50, grams, except now it's 50 grams of liquid water, so it's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
And now our temperature change is 38.0. I think I even still have these numbers written down from when I was very feverishly going through this as fast as I could on Friday afternoon to get it ready for everybody. So I got Q1, 1.33 kilojoules, which roughly makes sense. 50 times two is 100 times another 10 would give us, what, about 1,000, right? Very roughly. We're just trying to do a reasonableness check. So something like 1.33 kilojoules seems reasonable. And Q3 should be roughly doubled and then times three. So six times greater than that, roughly at 7.95. So everybody see how I'm getting rough ideas in my head before, before we actually hit enter on the calculator, right? We want to know if it's a reasonable number. Do some mental math. Round to really easy numbers and get close. Yeah. Either way, I, I find it easier to do it in kilojoules first because this is easier to keep track of the right number of sig figs when I do my adding. I don't have to do anything in scientific notation to keep the right number of sig figs if I switch to kilojoules first. You, you need to, anytime you're going to change operations, you have to change sig, you have to, to do your rounding. So like if all you're doing is a bunch of adding and subtracting, I don't care, you probably should just round at the very end. You don't need to round every step of the way, but it should be about the same if you do round every step. If everything is multiplication and division, I don't care if you round every step or at the very end. But if you switch from multiplication and division to addition and subtraction, you need to round before you switch rules, right? So it's because we switch our rounding rules. That's why we have to do it in the middle of the problem. Because... Yeah, we'll, we'll see more examples of why that matters down the road, but. All right, Q2. Any questions on this so far? You're looking okay. Sometimes chattering can be because I'm, I lost everybody because I said something weird, or sometimes the chatter can be that, that we're going too slow and everybody's getting bored. So I'm just trying to judge that right there. Um, Q2 is easy one, right? We have grams and we have heat of fusion in joules per gram. So 50 grams and for every one gram, it takes 334 joules. So roughly speaking, if it was just multiplied by 10, that'd be three, three kilojoules, three times five, it's going to be something around 15 kilojoules, 16 kilojoules. When we hit enter on our calculator, and I got 16.7. It looks like we lost a sig fig, or we lost a decimal place on that one, right? Because we only get to keep three sig figs. But since we got above 10, all of a sudden our three sig figs only goes to the tenths place. So it is going to mess with our sig figs a little bit when we add everything up, right? Because once we add, what's the rule for sig figs? Least number of decimals, right? You keep the uncertainty in the, in the um, largest digit. Where did you get the numbers for the Q2 equations? You did the math, and then where does, like, I know that that's the enthalpy, but why did you, like, multiply it? So because just like with a density or with a speed, if you have a combined unit, you got joules per gram, I'm just going to cancel it. Just like it's a conversion, because it is a conversion. It's just a conversion. Like, um, for that one, but it's not 
changing because delta t is zero right for a phase change the different process the way to think about the phase changes and why they don't change temperature is all of the extra energy you're putting into a system is going to, towards melting the ice. None, there's none left over to, to change any temperature until you get all of the ice melted. And then when you keep dumping more energy in, then it can go to making things speed up and get faster. Number three, which one was that? The iron one? You just want to know if you got the right answer or not? Just hang out after class. All right. Any conceptual issues that you had? If, if you're interested in knowing if you got the right answer for the iron one where I mixed up the units, stick around for a minute or two after class and I'll give you the right answer if you assume grams instead of pounds. Um, but it was a pretty small right. number either way. Shouldn't have been negative. Okay, <laughs> let's look at it. Um, yes. First stop, you're losing energy. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, yes, then yeah. From the point of view of the iron, the iron loses energy, yes. So it should have been a negative number. But you can also do that by just saying calories or joules lost. You don't have to use a negative sign if you, if you describe it as joules lost or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Did everybody hear that question? Delta T is positive for this one. When we started at negative 12 and we went to zero, right? Because delta T is final minus initial. So plus 12. We're just going to add them. Total Q, add them together. Only report your number to the tenths place. Right? We switched rules. So our final answer for this for this multi-step one. 1.3 plus 8 is 9.3 plus 16.7. 7, 17, 26.0? All right, we're feeling good about energy now. I'm glad you bring that up. All right, so announcement time. Not, I guess, also a reminder, we'll do a week from tomorrow um, will be the elements quiz. I realize you guys have to meet here on Tuesdays anyway, even though I can't be here. So why do I have to sit through proctoring the quiz? So you guys will take the quiz with, with Tomes on a week from tomorrow on element names and symbols, okay? No numbers, I'm not giving you a blank periodic table and asking you to fill it out. Just if I say AU, you write gold. If I say silver, you write AG. Just the names and symbols back and forth. Uh, is it a canvas quiz or on paper? It'll be on paper, it'll be in, in class. Closed, closed book, cover up the periodic table, all of them. That's Symbol. That's that. Um, yeah, atomic symbol element name. We're gonna do all of them. All of them, all 118. Most of them are really easy. What about the ones that are like? Well, if you look at a more up to date periodic table, they're all on the Good question. Who wants to know my feelings on spelling? All right. All right, up here, up here, guys. This is, I'm not going to be that picky on spelling. If somebody else who has taken a chemistry class can look at what you wrote and get to the right name, that's good enough. But if you do something like leave out a whole um, syllable or you, you change, like some, some of them have very specific letters that are really important. Like if you misspelled zinc by writing L-I-N-K, or that's that's a significantly different word now, right? That's I'm not going to give you credit for that kind of misspelling. 
Um, but if, if a reasonable person who has taken chemistry can look at what you wrote and figure out what you meant, I'm going to give you credit for it. Um, and there's a sliding scale there. If it's like almost there, um, then half credit. But if it's really, really bad, zero. Right, Gwen? A week from tomorrow, next Tuesday. Are we actually doing everything? I'm, well, I'm not going to ask you 182 questions. I'm going to pick and choose, and it's going to favor the ones that are more, more common. So it's going to, most of the questions are going to be on the top five rows. It's not 182 questions. <laughs> um, make, make note cards. I think I have some links for uh, Quizlet. Do you guys use Quizlet before? No. So I have I have put them all into Quizlet. So there's a Quizlet link that I can give you, so you can you can practice that way. Just make your note cards. Do the best you can. The way that I would do it is I would go through make up note cards, and go through them all, and the ones you get right put them in one file. The ones you get wrong put them in another file. They go through the ones that you got wrong again until you get them right. Um, and that way you're going to wind up focusing on the weird ones that aren't close to where the symbols and the names aren't that close to each other. Um, you'll spend more time with those. And some of those are actually kind of interesting to read about the history of them. Like um, tungsten is W. Does anybody know why? It's not Latin. It's one of the few that's not Latin. It's German, actually. The Germans and the English discovered, or a research group from Germany and a research group from, from England discovered tungsten at roughly the same time. And so rather than argue about who discovered it first and get some naming rights, they let the Germans pick the symbol and they let the English pick the name. So the, the English named it tungsten. The German um, word for, for tungsten is wolfram. Um, so they, that was sort of a, a, a compromise that way. Wolfram is a German word beyond just the element, but I don't know German very well, so I would have to I would have to double check that. <laughs> Not that word. It could be somebody's name too. All right. Any other questions about the quiz? The elements. Okay. Let me know if you want to come back to it. All right. <laughs> Other than that, the, the plan for this week is going to be that anybody who raised your hand on for lab last week. All right. So if you need to make up the specific heat, so Ren and Noah, at the very least, um, you guys can, can um, take the data tomorrow. Um, it's pretty easy. Boil some water. Um, with uh, some metal in it, and then add the metal to room temperature water. Watch the temperature change. Okay. Um, and and uh, Mr. Debate, I'll I'll help pull stuff out as much as I can for them this, this, this afternoon. So but they'll do that tomorrow. Everybody else has an assignment with practicing with energy questions. Right. So we won't do a new lab this week. It's going to be two paper assignments instead. One that's going to be more mathematical on energy, and the one on Thursday is going to be about atomic structure, so counting protons, neutrons, and electrons, um, stuff like that. Okay. No, that was another good question. On the, if you have a big percent error on your labs, am I going to take opportunities for it? No, not yet. When you get higher up, when you get to your second year in college. Um, in a science major, it's usually when you start seeing, like, you better get close to the right answer or you're going to get docked points. At this point, what we're trying, as educators, what we're trying to instill is that report your real numbers, even if they're not right. Because plagiarism and fabrication of data is a much bigger issue than just not getting the right answer. Right? So you will not be penalized in this class for reporting your real numbers. Um, just because they're not close to the real to what they're supposed to be, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So never fabricate your data. If you write down somebody else's data because you weren't here, say that you wrote it down. You'll be penalized less. Adeline. If you're here, so five of the ten points on labs is going to be for being here and doing the procedure, learning the process. 
all that. The other five points is the calculations and answering the questions. So for this first one, there really were no like analysis questions. It was just do the math. Um, but sometimes it will be like, um, explain what why this happened sort of portion. But yeah, as long as you, if you're here and you do the, the lab and you do the right, even if your data is bad, you're going to get 100% on that lab. Um, number one place people do mess up is sig big errors, but that's still going to be like 9.75 out of 10. Right, so if you're here and you do the work, labs are going to bring your grade up. Philip, this is kind of unrelated, but do you have binder checks? I don't do binder checks. Don't do any. You guys check, take your own notes. You're responsible for that. I don't want to get involved in maintaining other people's notebooks. I have a hard enough time maintaining my own. So. Was that a good real? Anything in the single digits for percent error is pretty good for this lab. Um, if you got anything, if you got above 30% error, then maybe we could talk about why it's so far off. But again, I'm not gonna mark you down just because you got really high percent error. Um, it's more about what's wrong with the, if you get more than 30% error, something's wrong with the experiment. We made an assumption somewhere that's not valid. So that's when we would normally start talking about, well, what did we do wrong? How can we change this experiment to make it better? Um, what did we neglect? So like, what's one thing that we didn't take into account about your lab from last week? Was one place they could have fallen apart where your numbers could be wrong? Jay? The actual assuming that it's been like, Yeah. It's like less less. Yeah, if you didn't leave your metal in the boiling water long enough, it might not actually get to the same temperature as your hot water bath. Um, so that's absolutely a source of error. Um, any Anybody else have any ideas? What else could have gone wrong? Yeah, if you if you're if you want more than one sig fig on your final answer, you needed to have at least one full degree of temperature change, right? Because your thermometer is only measured to the tenth place. So that's a good source of error right there because you might have just rounded as you had to round because you only got to keep one sig fig. Um, and that could mean that you wind up reporting your specific heat as 0.5 instead of 4.6 or 0.46. And if the real answer is 0.44 and your 0.46 got rounded to five, like all of a sudden your percent error just got huge, right? Um, just because you had to round. So that's one of the reasons why we, we might change the this lab by having less water in the cup, right? If you had less water in the cup, you could get a bigger delta T. The bigger delta T, you wind up having getting to keep more sig figs. Um, I was also just gonna say, like actually transferring the Yeah, the process of transferring to the to your calorimeter. Um, you're going to lose some heat. It's not exactly the same temperature. Um, the other big one is, is the water really, is the water and the copper, were they really the only two things changing temperature? Yeah, the cup changed temperature too, right? So some of your energy actually went in to warm up the cup, which is why we use styrofoam because styrofoam has a very low specific heat and it also doesn't absorb energy very well. But just the fact that we ignored that, we assumed that 0% of the energy goes to the cup. That's a source of error right there, right? So this is a really, really basic lab in terms of there's a lot of places we could make it better. Um, and in fact, if you do, if you wind up taking, I guess it wasn't until my third year in college, um, you take physical chemistry, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's literally where physics and chemistry mesh. Um, they basically basically did the same exact lab, um, except with much, much better tools and much better understanding of, well, we need to measure how much energy is going to heating up the container. We actually took that into account and measured it. Um, and we did a process called, it's called bomb calorimetry, because you literally take like a sample of food, put it into a very, into a very well sealed stainless steel container and pump a bunch of oxygen into it. Uh, and then it has a like a little barbecue sparker, a spark igniter on there. And so you literally just 
um, burn the sugar in an oxygen rich environment, watch how the temperature of the water around that container changes. And we just do the same exact thing you did, but with more sig figs, because we know a little bit more about how to fix some of these experimental flaws that we just talked about. Um, so it's not, it's a, a very classic um, lab experiment for a reason. One, because it's easy to do with anything. And two, because you can also make it really complicated by trying to get as many details corrected as possible. All right, but um, for this first one, I'm not, if you, if you were more than 30% error and you want to and make a, a note of, here's where I think we went wrong um, or what you think might've been the, the biggest source of error for your particular case. Maybe you spilled some of the metal um, and it didn't all make it there or you let it sit out or you, something like that. Whatever happened in your particular case that you think might've been the biggest source of error, just make a little note. It depends. It depends on the class. It depends on the lab. In physics class, like 5% error is a big percent error. Um, chemistry has a lot more variables in it. And so in chemistry class, on a lab like this, we'd be aiming for something like um, single digits percent error. There are some experiments that we do where if we get to the right order of magnitude, meaning um, you know, we're not off by a factor of 10, that's good enough. Like that's a pretty good result. When you're trying to calculate a number that's 10 to the 21, if you get seven times 10 to the 21 and the real number was three times 10 to the 21, it's a huge percent error. But the fact that it's 10 to the 21 and we at least got 10 to the 21, that's pretty good right there. So it depends a lot on what the experiment is um, when it comes to, to figuring out what's reasonable that way. Yeah, there's at least there's at least two we do in Gen Chem towards the end that have an exponential relationship. You measure a number and then that number goes into an e to the power of um, equation. And so if you're off by a little bit, it winds up making your final answer off by, like I said, a factor of 10 pretty easily. Um, turns out exponential relationships are can make small differences really, really big. All right. Any more questions on the quizzes or any other logistical stuff before we get going? Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about not math. Well, we won't do the math. The math is there. All right, this is where we ended the other day, right? We talked about protons and electrons. It was the discovery of electrons that led to discovery of protons. So here was, we, de we defined some terms here. The elements are the different types of atoms you can have. And they're always defined by the atomic number, which is the same as what? Number of protons. So counting the number of protons, it's really easy, you don't even have to count them. Find it on the periodic table, whatever element you're talking about. It's got an atomic number there. That is your number of protons. Atomic symbol is not the element name. Atomic symbol is the abbreviation, one or two letter abbreviation. And again, this is going to be one of the places where we're gonna, we're gonna have to be very picky about capitalization because you need to make sure that somebody reading your your writing is going to know whether or not um what's a good one i guess that's a problem because that could be read two different ways right that could be carbon and iodine or that could be chlorine right so not only am I gonna be kind of picky on that quiz next week about capitalization, if you write something uppercase or lowercase, it needs to be unambiguous, meaning there's no way it could be misinterpreted. So if you're writing a capital I, put the, the line top and bottom. If you're writing a lowercase L, 
either add the tail to it um, or for whatever reason, this has always stuck with me. I learned this from my high school chem teacher. When you're writing atomic symbols, lowercase l's, you just write them cursive because then there's no way you can misinterpret that. You can't confuse yourself if you make your L too big or if you forgot to forget to add the tail to it. That's chlorine. That's ambiguous. And this is carbon and iodine. Right, so we want one of these, not that. Um, Na for sodium is one of the ones that's not where that symbol doesn't match the name. And that is, like, like I mentioned before, most of those are going to be because there's a Latin name for the element. So sodium has been known since ancient times. Um, and so that the Latin name for sodium is natrium. Um, so the abbreviation is NA, for, even though the English word is sodium. A lot of this is because English is the dominant language in the in the 1700s, 1800s when it came to, to communicating in science. Um, and English is a mess of a language from five different sources easily. Um, all sorts, trying to incorporate all of these different things, which means the elements get really weird too. Um, sometimes that can help you remember them. For instance, if you can remember that silver is AG for argentum, because again, Latin, um, the let, or, uh, mercury is actually pretty easy to remember from that too, because mercury's name in Latin literally translates to uh, liquid silver. The name for mercury in Latin is hydro argentum, which is why, where HG comes from. There's argentum is silver and then hydro argentum is, is mercury. So when you're doing your studying, it might actually be helpful sometimes to, especially if there's one that really doesn't seem like it's connected at all, um, go look at the history of it. See why it's named in a funny way. It might help it stick in your head and remember it better. Um, I think if there's any other good ones. Either way, there are lots of other good stories in there. All right. So our atomic symbol is always one or two letters. It's always capital first letter, lowercase second letter. This is not somebody's question. I don't know. Actually, I haven't looked at all the questions from last weekend yet. But this is usually a question that I get pretty early is, are, is it possible there are other elements that we haven't discovered yet? Or how do we make all those those new elements? How come we're still adding stuff to the bottom of the periodic table? Um, because it turns out once you get larger than a certain size nucleus, they get really unstable. Um, basically, the, what holds together the nucleus of, of these atoms is combination of, of the strong and weak nuclear force, which is you know, if you take physics, it's, that's two of the four fundamental forces. Um, it's a balancing act between them. And once you get above a certain size, there is no stable nucleus. Um, basically, they will all break down into smaller pieces once you get larger than a certain size. But we can make new ones by just slamming stuff together really, really fast. Um, if you ever wondered what a particle accelerator is, You've heard that term, like the one in CERN um, in Switzerland or the one in Stanford. Um, a particle accelerator literally just takes little tiny pieces of matter and accelerates them so they're going super fast by using electromagnets and then slams them into each other. And sometimes if you do that fast enough, you can actually cause a fusion reaction and cause the nuclei to fuse together and you make a new nucleus. Um, so yeah, we absolutely can have more elements that we haven't discovered yet. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we keep building these particle accelerators. Seems like a big waste of money, right? They're billions and billions of dollars. And all we're doing is making new elements that have a half-life in the measured in the seconds. Um, except that physics and knowing the strong and weak nuclear force predicts that there should be some stable elements with half-lives to be measured in the, um, in the years to for, um, perhaps decades. They should have some really, really interesting properties in about the 122 to 125 range. We can only make elements as big as 118 right now, but there should be some good ones out there we haven't been able to make yet just because we need a bigger particle accelerator. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we keep spending money on those.
I better probably just save them. Maybe if I keep them in the office. That office. I don't know if they're using um, when I say better properties, I mean interesting properties. At least um, we can ex we can predict some of what those elements might, some of the properties they might have. Um, and they should be very, very conductive and very, very high density. Um, so those you know could potentially be very useful in terms of making new alloys for um, for certain for certain applications like spacecraft or um, even making nuclear reactors out of them potentially. It might be the sort of thing where if we dump a whole bunch of energy into it to make a bunch of this radioactive isotope, but then make it a nuclear power plant based around it, wind up, it might wind up being a, a valid way of storing energy. Um, effectively making a battery by making your own radioisotope. All right, so first basic skill from this is what, what we call atomic structure, um, is being able to look at a symbol and a charge and figure out how many protons and electrons something has, as well as practicing our naming and um, filling out charts like this. So if we have an atomic number, so if we just have the element symbol, that's enough to figure out all of this. The element symbol is N. Nitrogen. So you guys already know more than you think you do. 118 is going to be easy. Nitrogen. So we find it on the periodic table. It's number seven, right? So atomic number is seven, which means seven protons. Seven, seven, atomic number seven, seven protons. Um, the abbreviation for protons, protons are not an element, right? There, it's a subatomic particle, it's smaller than an atom. So um, we wouldn't, we don't represent a proton with a capital letter. We would write it as seven lowercase p with a positive charge. Lowercase p with a positive charge is a shorthand for proton. Or you can write out the word protons. That's fine too. So then how do we know how many electrons it has? Um, we need it to add up to the charge, right? So if we've got seven pluses, if we have seven protons. Uh, keyboard shortcut doesn't work through the slides. Uh, the way to make it super script. There's a keyboard shortcut too, but I only know it for office. Uh, I think it's control super script that you hold shift. So, hold on. I think it's control six. Control six. <laughs> Not looking promising. Well, I'll, I'll figure that out later. If you're if you're in Office, if you're using Microsoft products. It's Control Shift equals equals, um, and it's Control e just Control equals the subscript. But either way, <laughs> so we know it has to. They have to add up to zero, right? Because the element symbol we were given doesn't have a charge. So we need we, means we need to have as many electrons as we have protons. So. That means we're going to have a seven seven electrons. What do you suppose the shorthand is for electrons? Lowercase e with the negative charge. That one gets used actually a lot more than protons because usually we don't. When we're talking about a nucleus, we're just talking about it as as the element. We use just use the atomic symbol. Um, but electrons moving around is what causes almost all chemical reactions. So we, a lot of times, deal with electrons moving around on their own. So we see this written fairly often. And element name is just practice. Nitrogen, right? But zinc. 
30, which means 30 protons. Which means since there's no charge, it's the same number of electrons. And knowing the name and the symbol, again, this is, this is why we're doing that quiz, why I'm just making you straight up memorize the names and the symbols is so that I don't have to go back and remind everybody when I say zinc, zinc sulfide and then that that means ZNS, that those are the same. We wanna be able to be fluent going back and forth between the names and the symbols just for the sake of being able to communicate with each other. Um, I should also say, just as a as a plug to make sure that you actually take it seriously, you are allowed to drop a quiz. You get to drop one quiz. Um, you don't want it to be the one in class because one, you know what it's going to be on there. It's pretty pretty easy to study for. Yeah, it's 118 things to learn, but they're not that hard, right? It's not a tricky math problem or anything, right? Um, the other reason is that if everybody just phones it in and the class average is below where I want the class's average to be, we'll do it again. But we're keeping all of the grades. You don't replace the grades if we have to do that, right? So if everybody phones it in and the class average is a 50%, you're keeping that 50% and we're doing it again until I'm happy with the class average. Um, so I appreciate the dramatic effect. That's perfect. Um, so don't just phone it in and say, I'm just going to drop the atoms quiz. Plus there's a more, there's a trickier one coming up on nomenclature that comes up in a couple weeks where you actually have to name, name compounds instead of just knowing the periodic table. You have to know the periodic table and be able to use that. So this one, all things considered is pretty easy. It, do a good job on this quiz. You'll be fine. All right. What do we do if there's a charge? All right. I know I got off topic talking about the quiz, scaring everybody. We'll bring it back. If we have a charge, the only thing that really changes is we, we still get to the number of protons the same way. That never changes. Number of protons is always based on the atomic number. So the only thing that can change is your number of electrons. And number of electrons, because electrons are negative, um, we always work backward from that and from the atomic number to figure out how many electrons we have. So if we have Na plus, Na with a plus one charge, well, the fact is Na tells us it's sodium, right? Go to your periodic table, 11 protons. It's a plus charge, so it has one extra proton compared to the number of electrons. So it has 10 electrons. It's really too bad that protons and electrons charges are the way they are um, because your charge goes down when you gain an electron, which is backwards, right? Usually when you gain something, property goes up. Um, it's all Ben Franklin's fault. As, as, as you may know, he did a little bit of scientific research. He figured out that you could create static charge by rubbing, I think he used rabbit fur on glass. Um, and you could create static charge that way. And he just arbitrarily decided, well, one of these is a positive charge and one of these is a negative charge. So he just picked it random. Um, I believe that it was the fur that got the extra electrons so that the fur was negative. Um, but if he had just guessed differently, then we'd be dealing with electrons with a positive charge, which would make a lot more sense when it comes to, I gained an electron and lost a charge. Um, doesn't make any sense, right? But it's just one of the things we kind of have to get used to because we're not going to be, ever be able to correct that at this point. Um, you know, 300 years of science research and math has gone into positives and negatives um, being this way. So we're stuck with it. It's all Ben Franklin's fault. All right, so positive charge means we lost an electron. So negative charge means we gained an electron, right? So if we had bromine, 
with a negative charge. The fact that it's bromine tells us where to look on the periodic table, right? 35 protons, 36 electrons. Um, a quick note about charges and the way we write the charges, they're always up into the right of the symbol. Um, but there's a little bit of leeway with how we write them because um, some, for instance, especially if you're typing things, sometimes the, the font can make it really hard to read if you put the negative in before the V1. So if you look up the way it's written on the slides, it's BR1 minus means the exact same thing as BR minus one. Um, but when you type, when you type it, you run into, does anybody know what kerning is? Yeah. It's when you're, if your font is not designed very well or for the application you're using it, you wind up with your letters running into each other, right? It's hard to tell them apart. Bromine in particular can wind up with a kerning issue where your negative sign runs into the R and it can be really hard to distinguish what that is. And so sometimes if it's convenient or if it makes it more clear to read, we just write it as one minus instead of minus one. It means the exact same thing. We do the same thing with plus charges. With plus charges, we don't always even write a uh, one. Um, some like we had on, on sodium, it's just Na plus. Na plus, Na one plus, Na plus one are all totally acceptable ways of writing the same thing, right? So don't get hung up on that. I'm not trying to, to trick you or anything if I write it differently. I'm just trying to make sure it's legible. All right. This is easy, right? You guys have all had chemistry before. This is like probably the, the thing you remember best about chemistry one, right? Was I can count protons and electrons, which is great because 10% of your midterm is going to be this, exactly this. Here's a table where count how many protons, neutrons, and electrons there are. 10% right there. I love to give 10 out of 10 on those ones. I've yet to ever give 10 out of 10 to an entire class on that problem. Seems easy enough, but somebody always messes something up somewhere, just miscounts or transposes two numbers or forgets that electrons are negative for a second. Um, there's always somebody um, or a few somebody's more likely that, that get that problem wrong, but I would love to give everybody 10 out of 10 for that problem on the midterm. All right, so I don't think we need to spend too much time on it right now. But we also haven't talked about neutrons yet, right? So we found electrons because Thompson found cathode rays, right? He made that vacuum tube, applied a voltage, and random tiny little negatively charged particles started flying through that system. Therefore, there existed something smaller than an atom. Um, and protons were found more or less the same way. Remember the gold foil experiment? Um, and that led to the nuclear theory. Neutrons were, we kind of just figured out that they existed because so there had to be something. Um, so for instance, even back then, they knew that hydrogen would only had one proton, and helium had two protons. So they had to be number one and two on the periodic table, although this was before the periodic table um, existed in its current form. But they, so they knew they had to be the first two elements, but helium was four times heavier instead of just twice as heavy. So literally just by process of elimination, like, well, there has to be something making up that mass. So we're just gonna call it a neutron because it doesn't appear to have a charge. Protons had a positive charge, electrons are negative charge, neutrons are there, they weigh something. We can tell that they're there, but they don't really have a charge, so we'll call them neutrons. Um, since then, we've done we've discovered a lot more properties of neutrons. Um, turns out that neutrons and protons are both made of three quarks. And if you flip one of those quarks from being an up quark to a down quark, you can flip a particle from being a neutron to a proton or vice versa. Um, so they're related to each other. They're tied to the forces that hold the nucleus together in the first place. Um, but at the time, they just said, well, it, 
has mass. It must be there. It, it exists. Um, which, incidentally, is the exact same logic that's used for dark matter. Dark matter is literally just stuff we know must be there, but we don't really know what it is or where. We know it must be there because of the way the galaxies orbit each other. We can look at the gravitational constants and say, well, based on the orbits, there has to be something there. We're just going to call it dark matter until we figure out what it is. Um, but that's kind of beside the point. Is that like the quarks in the dark matter? Is that like physics or is that more chemistry? That's physics. Um, and specifically, dark matter is mostly astrophysics. So theoretical physicists look at dark matter because they're trying to explain why things behave like that. But the people actually measuring um, things like the orbits of, of galaxies and things like that. And the ones who came up with the, the term dark matter, I believe, were astrophysicists. Um, which is just another way of saying astronomers that also know their physics. All right. So a more complete look at what's on the periodic table. Usually there's the atomic symbol and at element name. Although if you took a standardized test in chemistry, like the AP chem test, which, which y'all won't have to take, but I had to take it once upon a time, um, they give you a periodic table that doesn't have element names on it. It just has symbol and the number and the mass. Um, which so was a good thing I had a teacher who forced us to learn periodic table. So that wasn't a problem, but um, the mass number trips people up a little bit. Right, because the mass number is not really um, indicative of the properties of a single nucleus. That mass number is, is actually a weighted average. If you took a million atoms and they, some of them are going to have a different mass than others because they're going to have a different number of neutrons in the nucleus. If you took all of those masses, add them up, divided by a million to get the average, that's what gives you the mass number. But you have individual pieces um, that are not 39.944. They're gonna have different masses depending on what isotope they are, right? Which an isotope, um, an isotope just means, so then here's sort of a, a recap of the different ways we can, we can change things. If you change the number of protons, you change what element it is. If you change the number of electrons, you change what the overall charge is, and you make what's called an ion. So an ion is just anything where you have a mismatched number of protons and electrons. If you change the number of neutrons, you don't change the charge at all. You change the mass. And that's um, different combinations of neutrons are known as isotopes. All right, so the, the mass number is the weighted average on Earth of all of the isotopes of that particular element. So if you look at the big periodic table over here, let's see, what does it say for it? So most of them have, have a lot of decimals, have some sig figs for their atomic mass numbers, right? Um, so like phosphorus is 30.974. Some of them don't have a mass number in with decimals, though. So. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. But in general, if something is really close to a whole number, you can say that that's the most common isotope on Earth. But it's not the only stable isotope, necessarily. One of these days, I'm going to get used to going to this computer to the other one. Um, so if we're looking at the average argon atom, we can know, we know how many protons are in it because it's argon. We know how many electrons it has because it says it has no charge. We can guess how many neutrons it has, but unless I specifically tell you what isotope you're dealing with, that's kind of hard to do, right? So if we were guessing based uh, what isotope we're looking at, that's really close to 30 to 40, right? The mass number for argon. So we might say, okay, well, if it's got 18 protons, 
the mass number is always going to be the sum of protons plus neutrons. They weigh about the same as each other. So you can just say, okay, well, if 18 of my mass is protons, the remainder of that 40 must be neutrons. Right, so we would just say for this case, assuming that it's argon 40 is the, the isotope we're dealing with because that's what the mass number is closest to. To write the mass number more explicitly, you write it up into the left of the element of the atomic number, sorry, atomic symbol. Right, so charge goes up into the right. And if there's nothing written, assume it's a charge of zero. Mass goes up into the left. And if it's not written, assume that it's a mixture of, of isotopes that's, they say it's the, the naturally occurring abundance, meaning you just look at the periodic table to figure it out what that average mass is. But if it's specifically written, this is saying argon 40 means that the total mass is 40 and it's 18 protons, 18 electrons, and 22 neutrons, which are written as a lowercase n with a zero charge. This is the only time you ever really write zero as a charge is when you're saying something is a neutron because that's part of indicating what lowercase n means, right? Same way we did protons and electrons, that's a neutron. There's another naturally occurring isotope of argon though, argon 39. Argon 39 doesn't have 22 neutrons. The only thing that's different about these, still the same number of protons, still the same number of electrons. It behaves the same, it reacts the same way, but it has a mass number of 39 instead of 40. All right, so this isotope of argon would still be 18 protons, would still be 18 electrons because there's still no charge, but just be 21 neutrons. And if you're ever worried, about being able to keep track of these charges. There's two good dead jokes. Two atoms are walking along the sidewalk. And one atom says, I think I lost an electron. The other atom says, are you sure? The first electron, or the first one says, I'm positive. But um. <laughs> uh, the other one is a neutron walks into a bar. And he said, looks at the bartender and says, how much for a beer? And the bartender says, for you, no charge. Uh, I know, right? Our chemists have to take, take their jokes where we can because most of them are not things that most people would find funny necessarily. Um, chemists have, kind of have their own inside jokes because you, unless you take a whole bunch of chemistry, they just don't make sense. Um, so... The jokes that the average um, high school chem student understands are, tend to be a little bad jokey um, based on bad puns. But what are you going to do? Even if it's cringe, you know, you still will remember that a little bit, right? So you're saying that the really complex ones aren't corny dad jokes? Or are they also They're similar? less likely to be corny dad jokes. <laughs> Always. Because if you think about it, let's look at what happens when you just go to the, um, the second smallest element. We look at helium. Helium has two protons in, it, in the nucleus, right? Well, if we look at that nucleus, so it's basically we represent it as being sort of four spheres. Two of them are protons. Well, protons are both positive, right? And what do positive charges do to other char positive charges? They repel things, right? So opposites attract, like charges repel each other. The fact that a helium nucleus even exists um, is only because of neutrons. You need neutrons present in the nucleus. Anytime you've got more than 
um, one proton to basically mediate, to kind of keep them from pushing each other away. Something about neutrons and protons, when you get them all close enough together, you get interactions um, of the strong nuclear force. We call it the strong nuclear force because it holds things together um, more than, it's, than it lets them split apart. It's literally, that's literally the name of it, strong nuclear force. They, they were not, um, whoever named that was you know, lacking on the creativity, um, which made up for, by the way, they named quarks. Quarks are really weird the way that those are named. Um, so the strong nuclear force is what happens when neutrons and protons are together in the same nucleus and it keeps the protons from flying apart and just the whole thing just disappearing. Um, but you have to have the right number of neutrons relative to the number of protons for this to happen. So two neutrons is with two protons is pretty stable. That's why it's the most common um, isotope. And if you look at, at the periodic table, 4.003, is that what it says? So it's really close to a mass of four, right? Which, which tells us um, almost all the helium on earth looks like this. You can have helium three though. Helium three is also relatively stable, um, but it's not as stable. So the number of neutrons that you can have in the nucleus is always predicated by how many protons do you have and sort of balancing out those strong and weak nuclear forces. The weak nuclear force is the one that would make it fall, fall apart when it gets too big. Strong nuclear force is the one that holds it together as long as they're small, as long as they're smaller than lead. I believe is lead 208 is the largest stable um, element in isotope. Anything above that, everything above lead on the periodic table um, is radioactive to some extent. Uh, because your strong nuclear force can't balance out the weak nuclear force once you get above a certain size. All right. The other point I just want to make is that every element is a specific isotope. Every atom is a specific isotope. Just because it's the most common isotope, people seem to think of isotope means it's the exception. Everything is an isotope. It's just a matter of, is it the most common isotope or is it one of the more rare ones? Right. So I try to be really careful with my language because I always hear, well, it's not an isotope, it's helium-4. No, helium-4 is an isotope. It's just the most common one on Earth. Again, we're also going to, we've talked about our Earth-centric viewpoint here, right? If we change um, planets, we'd have a different ratio of different isotopes. All the elements would be the same, but the mass numbers would be different. Because you might have extra hydrogen, too, or you might not have as much carbon-14. Things like that would change if we were on a different planet, and so mass numbers would be different. But chemistry would also be the same. All right. 10 minutes left, five. All right. We didn't talk about Mendeleev, did we? I mentioned Mendeleev on Friday and everybody's like, oh yeah, we talked about Mendeleev. We didn't talk about him, did we? Yeah. Okay. Um, I like Mendeleev. Well, I didn't know him personally. I um, mean, all signs point to if I did know him personally, I wouldn't like him. But I like his story because it really points out that he was that scientists are just people. Right? So Mendeleev's life story reads like he's a Tolstoy character. He was the youngest of 17, um, only 13 of which lived to adulthood. His, his father was a literature professor at a university in Russia. Um, so comfortably bougie, middle class. Um, however, his dad went blind when he was very young. And it's not like they had much in the way of unions in the, in the uh, mid 1800s in Russia. Um, and so you ha he had no protection. The university like, well, you can't teach, you're blind. You know, you don't have a job anymore. So he's no longer comfortably middle class. His mom got a job in a factory um, to try and support them, except then the factory burned down. So it's just like one thing after another for this kid, right? Um, she takes him all the way across Russia to a different city because they had um, a program that would accept him at a very young age to go to a university, basically at the age of 12. Um, and, but they, he was you know, 
was poor for his entire life after that, after having initially been raised with some amount of privilege. Um, so when he was at university, he realized that if you take the list of elements, if you order them a certain way, patterns start showing up. So up to this point, people had, a, if you needed to look up properties of a specific element, you went to the back of your textbook and it was just a list, um, usually alphabetical, so you could find things easier. Mendeleev is the one who realized, well, if you list them by the size, instead, you start seeing patterns. Ooh, that formatting really didn't, well, didn't like that. Um, we found out that at every eight elements, you started having repeating properties. So hydrogen, and then eight elements later, fluorine, and then eight elements later, fluorine, all had similar properties. Helium, and then eight elements later, neon, and then eight elements later, argon, had similar properties. So Mendeleev actually invented the periodic table. Because he said, I'm just going to put everything with similar properties goes in the same column. And so he wound up with the earliest versions of the periodic table would have looked something like this. They started trying to put them into groups, categorize them by how reactive they were. Um, and oddly enough, for whatever reason, Mendeleev was Russian, but the earliest periodic table I could find has it in, written in, in Italian. Um, your guess is as good as mine. But the point remains is that what Mendeleev found when he did that is that there were gaps in the periodic table. There were spaces where something should be that they hadn't found yet. So it basically told them where to look for new elements. Here's the part where it gets really interesting. So Mendeleev's Russian, this is the mid 1800s, Russians and Germans, I don't know how they feel about each other to this day, but they, historically they've never gotten along very well. Um, Mendeleev predicts that germanium exists. Um, but the group that first finds it is German. Mendeleev makes the claim that he should be the one who get to name it because he predicted it should be there. Um, except that universally, the entire world of chemists all agrees, nah, Mendeleev, you're a jerk. Um, he had ongoing disputes with everybody in the scientific community. And so they all unanimously practically voted against him and they named it after his country's biggest rival, Germany, almost as a personal screw you to Mendeleev. Um, and in fact, he was such a jerk that it took about a hundred years after he died before when everybody that had known him personally had also died before they actually ever named an element after him. And this is the guy who literally invented the periodic table and he didn't get an element named after him until he was dead for a hundred years. Uh, Mendelevium is in the very bottom um, because he was a jerk from all accounts. All right. That's all we're going to get through today. We'll talk about quantum mechanics on. I'll see you all on uh, Wednesday. Check in on your screens. Yeah. 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 Let me let me stop recording and.